Father, we are asking that you will order our steps. And Lord, as we look at the story of Abraham and see how you ordered his steps, we pray that today decisions might be made that will result in eternal results. For Jesus' sake, amen. A group of Cubans escaped on a raft determined to sail to find the good life in the USA. They sailed for several days and finally they sighted land. And you can just imagine how excited they were. They were bursting with excitement to have made it to the United States. They pulled up to the shore, got off their little raft. They kissed the ground when they stepped ashore. And after they went ashore, they soon saw some men and they were surprised that so many of them were smoking marijuana. And when they listened to them, they were surprised because this didn't sound like the Americans they had seen on TV. It wasn't too long before they made a major discovery. They were not in America. They had sailed in the wrong direction and were in Jamaica. <laughs> It's good to pursue your dream, but make sure you have someone who knows the right direction. Am I right about that? God wants us to dream. And here, I'm here to tell you, he knows the right direction. God wants us to expect great things from him and to attempt great things from him. And this morning, we're beginning a new series entitled Pursuing God's Promises. And this series is designed to help us achieve God's purpose for our lives. This is an important series as we talk about pursuing God's promises. God has a big plan for you. And so I'm hoping, you know, sometimes if we're not careful, we get into the, 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 the routine that we come to church when we feel like. But I'm trusting that you will make... Make a commitment to be here every week unless you're sick or you must go out of town. I'm trusting and challenging you to be here every week to hear what God has to say from this life-changing series based on the life of Abraham. It was now more than 300 years after Noah's flood. And Noah's flood was the last record of God speaking to men. And that was a long time. 300 years had passed and there is no indication from scripture that they had heard from God. But the wait was about to end because God was about to speak to Abraham. Making him promises that would change the world forever. The first thing I want to talk about as we move forward is that receiving God's promises is an act of His grace. As I prepared, I was struck by that, that receiving God's promises is an act of His grace. Because the first thing I noticed as I studied is that no request had to be made. No request had to be made. Here in Genesis chapter 12, verse number 2, God says, I will make you. Abraham had asked for nothing. And God says, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great. And you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. No request had to be made. And yet God made Abram three great promises. Now you'll notice that Abraham at this point is not Abraham. He's Abram. And at some point, A-B-R-A-M, we will eventually get to the name change as we move along. God made three huge promises. He promises him land 
I will make you a great nation. He promises him seed. I will make your name great. He promises him blessing. I will bless you and make you a blessing. And all people on earth will be blessed because of you. And God kept his word. Abraham's descendants today possess the land of Israel. His seed, the Jews and the Arabs have made his name great. All people on earth have been blessed by Abraham because from his line came the savior of the world. God keeps his promises. But God, I hope you're listening to me. Young people, young person particularly, I hope you're listening to me good. Regardless of your age, because I want you to know that God not only had big plans for Abram, he has big plans for you and me as well. I wish I had a church that really believed that. I, I, wish, I wish every person in this audience this morning really believed that God has a big plan for you. Young person, do you believe that God has a, a big plan? This same God who comes to Abraham and promises them these incredible blessings. This God has a special plan for you. Here's what he says in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 through 13. And we're going to put it up. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to what? To prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. The, listen, God has some plans. But listen, they are conditional plans. And we're going to get there in a while. Because if you notice in the case of Abraham, there were conditional plans. There were some stuff Abraham had to do. And we're going to have to talk about that. The verse says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me and I will listen. You will seek me and find me. Help me out somebody. Finish it with me. When what? When you what? Seek me with all your heart. Let me ask you. Are you seeking God with all your heart? God has a big plan for you. The problem is, it's not, you listen, 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 come on now. The reason we are not experiencing God's big plan is not God's fault. The problem is, we are not seeking God with all our hearts. And young person, an older one, I need to ask you, are you seeking him with all your heart? He has a big plan. Don't miss it. In my late teens, after all my years as an undercover Christian, I wrote the words of Jesus in my Bible because I had finally got it. I finally got it, what it was all about. And I wrote John's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 4, in the front of my Bible as my commitment to God. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night comes when no man can work. I had no idea at the time what God's plan for me was. But I'm here to tell you, God had a big plan. God had an amazing plan. And I'm here to tell you, come on. He's got a big plan for you. That, that, that's, why we, that's why we're going through this series, pursuing God's promises. Listen. God has a big plan for you. Number one, no request had to be made. But second, 
A sinful past was not a disqualifier. A sinful past was not a disqualifier. Abraham was from a family of idol worshippers. In the book of Joshua, chapter 24, verse number 2 and 3, here's what it says. Joshua, chapter 24, verse 2 and 3. And Joshua said to all the people, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Long ago your fathers lived beyond the Euphrates, Terah, the father of Abraham and of Nahor, and they served what? These were eyes of worshiping people. Then I took your father Abraham from beyond this idol worshiping guy from beyond the river and led him through all the land of Canaan and made his offspring many. Who would have thought that God would pick this man from an idol worshiping family to make him the one through whom the redeemer of the world should come? Who would have thought that God would pick a person like you and me who has messed up so bad? Come on now, don't go on like you were born in heaven. But who would have thought that God, despite your past, despite my past, despite my failure and my failings, who would have thought that this God would have this incredible plan for me. And you don't even know what the plan is yet. You see, don't, 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 don't miss this. God has chosen to use imperfect people to accomplish his perfect will. He has chosen to use imperfect people to accomplish his perfect will. I'm not sure what type of mess you've got. I know about my mess. I don't know your mess and I don't need to know your mess. But I want you to know, young person, older person, I want you to know God wants to rewrite your story. Did you hear what I just said? God wants to rewrite your story. So don't close the book when God is still writing a chapter. Don't close the book when God is still writing a chapter. God is not finished with you yet. And it doesn't matter what your history is. God is willing, listen to me this morning. God is willing to rewrite your story. He said, Brother Brian, you don't know what I have done since I have come to Christ. I don't know what you have done, but God knows. And if this morning you would come to God and says, God, I'm willing to change. God, I want to go your way. God, I want to seek you with all my heart. God, I want to serve you with everything, every fiber of my being. God is willing to rewrite your story. You say, Brother Brian, I'm not even saved. Oh, what a, what a wonderful privilege it is to preach this gospel of Christ. A gospel about a Savior who loves you and is willing to save you and change you by the power of the Almighty God. God is willing to rewrite your story. So don't close the book when God is still writing a chapter. But third... Personal qualifications are not required. You hear what I said? Personal qualifications for God to execute his amazing plan for you. I'm talking to you, young man. For God to execute his amazing plan for you, personal qualifications are not required. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2 and 3. I notice if you, I'm sure it's in your Bible the same way. God shows up and God says, I will. I will make you great. I will bless you. I will bless. Listen. It's not about you and what you bring to the table. God does not need to call the qualified 
He can qualify the called. Are you with me this morning? He does not need to call the qualified. He doesn't need you to come to him with your resume and show him all you've got on your resume. You can come to him with a blank slate. You say to him, God, I didn't even finish high school. I never even finished grammar school. God, my reading is bad. And God doesn't care what you, because it doesn't matter what you bring to the table. He can qualify the called. He has a plan for you and he can execute his plan if you are willing to go his way and to submit to him. I will make you, I will, I will. Now this might not have been a big deal if Abraham had already had a few sons. But you know the story, some of you know the story, there was a problem. Abraham was 75 years old. And his wife was 65. So can we be real? At that age, no baby was going to bake in that oven. Am I right about that? No baby was going to bake in that oven. And God comes and says, I'm going to make you a great nation. Let, let's be for real. Abraham brought nothing to the table. Abraham had, had absolutely no qualifications. God does not need your ability. He needs your availability. Are you available to God? Now don't un misunderstand me. S pursue the opportunities that God has given you. If God gives you an opportunity to go to school and to college, pursue those opportunities. But in your pursuit, never forget that the main mission is to bring glory to God. Because sometimes we are pursuing education so much, we don't even read our Bible. Don't tell me you're in the will of God. Oh, I'm going to talk now. Let me talk to my college students. Don't tell me you are in the will of God and you have no time for the things of God because you are pursuing the education. My Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Oh, by the way, I did go to school myself, so I know the challenges of school. I know the challenges of graduate school, but I came to find out that God is no man's debtor, and I came to find out that if I was serving God and doing what God wanted me to do, this unbelievable God, when I did my work, he would bring things to my attention. I understood faster by the goodness and grace of God. Listen, God can pull it off. God can pull it off. He pulls it off with this guy who... You know, some people think, oh God, you know, sometimes we make the mistake. We see these people with great resumes and we say, wow, can you imagine what God could do with this person if they got saved? We make it seem like their resume is that important to God. It's nice to have a good resume. But God doesn't need the resume. <laughs> he can qualify the God. But we got to change gears. It's one thing to realize that these promises are totally undeserved. But here's point B. Pursuing God's promises demands our response. If we're going to be talking about pursuing God's promises, you cannot pursue God's promises unless you respond appropriately. Here's number one. It demands separation. Abraham had to leave. Look here with me at Genesis chapter 1, chapter 12, verse 1. The Bible says, No, the Lord has. Said, had said to Abraham, get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house. 
Verse number four, so Abram departed as the Lord had spoken to him and Lot went with him. It demanded separation. God said, Abram, I've got a truckload of promises, but you'll have to leave the old life. Did you hear what I said? Abraham, I've got a truckload of promises, but you've got to leave the old life. That wasn't easy. Abraham was from Ur, the greatest city of that day, and God was calling him to leave. You see, Ur was like the good old USA. He, God was calling him to leave all the comforts and security of the big city to trade his home for a tent. But Abraham was willing to leave the old life to pursue God's promises. And if you and I are to cash in on the promises of God, God still demands separation. Teaching about separation seems old-fashioned. We don't want to talk about separation anymore. But you will never, listen good, you will never achieve God's dream for your life without leaving the old life. Let, let me say that again. Because I need this, I need you to get this young person who you think, listen, man, Brian, Brother Brian, you can talk as long as you like. I, we're on a trajectory that's taking us somewhere. I'm pursuing my dream. I'm doing this. I'm, listen, do you think that your dream is as big as... Do you know that God's dream for your life is bigger than any dream you can ever dream? You will never achieve His dream without leaving the old life. Abraham had to leave, and so do we. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Turn in your Bible. I want you to see this, so I'm not putting it on the screen. I want you to see this yourself. 1 Peter uh, chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And I want to read to, to you there uh, from uh, verses 1 to verse 3 of 1 Peter chapter 4. When you get there, say amen. amen. It says here, verse 4. 1 of chapter 4, therefore since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same mind. For he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, that he no longer, are you with me now? We're getting warm now. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the loss of men, but for the will of God, here, here, we're really hot, getting hot now. For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelings, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. The apostle says, we have spent enough time in this mess. And I'm here this morning to say to GCA that it's time for a change. We cannot continue. Listen, listen to me good. Because what is happening in the Christian church is a disgrace. Christians are living just like the world. We figure we can do whatever we want to do, live anyway. And the apostle says, no, no, no. We have spent enough time there. My friend, if you really want to achieve God's will, to experience God's will, you must decide to live a life of separation. You must decide to leave the old life. We cannot keep going the way we are going. You And this morning it is my prayer that the Spirit of God would challenge you and you would stop in your track and you would say, God, help me. I want to change. 
flip back in first you're in first Peter go to chapter 1 first Peter chapter 1 verse 14 of first Peter chapter 1 here is instead instead of this lifestyle oh I got a little salvation all I need you see, the problem with the, with the problem with the church is that we want to get enough Jesus to get to heaven. Enough Jesus to go to heaven, but we can live like the devil. That's not God's way. First Peter chapter 1, verse 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lives. Verse 15. But as he who called you is what? holy you also be what holy in what in all your conduct because it is written what be holy for I am holy oh I want to ask you this morning my friend is that your desire you know sometimes the worship singers sing holiness is what 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 I long for Holiness is what? What I need. Holiness, is that really what you're longing for? Come on now. Young man, older man, is holiness what you're longing for? Hold, the scripture says, enough of that stuff. It's time for holiness. 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 A little child was playing with a very valuable vase. He put his hand in and he couldn't get it out. And they did the best they could. His dad did everything he could. And it was a, a, a colored vase, so they, vase so they couldn't see what was inside the vase. They were about to break this very expensive vase. When the father said, he says, open your hand and hold your finger straight out just like you see me doing and then pull you see dad wasn't sure as to what the position of his fingers was so dad says oh, hold your fingers straight out and when the, when dad said that the little boy said no dad I couldn't do that because if I held my fingers straight out like that I would drop my dime This little boy had a fist in the vase, holding a dime. They were about to smash this expensive vase because this boy was holding a worthless dime. You say, Pastor, what is the relevance? There are people in this audience right this morning, you're holding a dime. You, you, you think what the world has to offer is so great. You're holding on to this dime. And God has all this stuff. And God is saying, it's time to let go of the dime. Let it go. I got some, I got stuff to blow your mind. You know, as the choir sings that song, as I look back over my life and things th think, think things over, I know I'm going to tell you as I prepare this message, uh, that song came to me. As I look back over my life, young person, I'm here to tell you, as I look back over my life and I think things over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I have a testimony. God has been so good to me. And I just wish and pray, oh, the burden of my heart is that I could, oh, but the Spirit of God would work in some young person, an older person's heart, that you would see that God is not trying to steal you from, steal anything from you. God has, God just wants to give you the very best. Let go of the dime. Let go of the dime. Let go of the old life. Take my life and let it be consecrated, 
Lord to thee. This morning, I'm going to be challenging some of you to come right out here. In a few moments, I'm going to be challenging you. I'm not done yet. But when I, at the end, I want to ask you, young man, older man, you may have done it, older person, woman, do it again and say, God, take my life. Let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Number one, it demands separation but it demands listen if we're going to pursue God's promises it demands a full commitment Genesis 12 is not the first time God had called Abraham that's why verse 1 reads the Lord had said to Abraham Acts chapter 7 verse 2 and 3 it says this Stephen said, Stephen tells us something that some other passages don't tell us. But look what it says there uh, in Acts chapter 7, verse 2 and 3. Stephen says, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. And what's the next word? Before he lived in Haran. Before he lived in Haran, God of glory appeared to our father and said to him, Go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. So guess what? Abraham left Ur in Mesopotamia. And he stopped halfway. He and his family stopped halfway in Haran. Haran was almost exactly halfway between Ur and Canaan. The tragedy of our day is that churches are full of people who have followed God halfway. They have followed God for salvation, but they don't want to turn the reins of their life over to Him. Am I talking to somebody like that this morning? You have trusted God for salvation, but so far you have not turned the reins over to Him. You have not said, God, whatever you want to do in my life. Don't forget what we read in Jeremiah 29, 13, it says, You'll seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. As you study the account of Abram, you, you get to realize that not much happened to Abraham when he was in Haran. Abraham left Ur, he was in Ab Haran, he was halfway, and there was no blessing in Haran. The blessing came when he went all the way to Canaan. And some of you are here this morning, and you're wondering, where's my blessing? I've been saved a long time, and I don't seem to be getting not, not much blessing. Part of the problem, I believe, is that there are some people here this morning who have stopped halfway. You're still in Haran. You have not made it to Canaan. You have not made a total commitment to Jesus Christ. Thank God for salvation. But salvation is just the entry door. God has a whole lot more for you. Amen. But thank God Abram finally obeyed. Think of what he would have missed. Can you? Are you with me this morning? Think of what Abraham would have missed. If Abram had stayed in Haran halfway, think of what he would have missed. There would have been no Isaac. No offspring. No blessing. No land. No seed. It's time to move on from Haran. It's time to go all the way.
away with Jesus. It's time for a full commitment. It's time to pursue God's promises. The young man had made a profession of faith when he was younger. And now he was dying. And as his mom passed his room, she heard him saying, Lost, lost, lost. She opened the door because she was worried that he had lost his hope in Christ. When she spoke to him, her son said, No, mom, I haven't lost my hope in Christ. I know where I'm, go where I'm going when I die. I'm just sad that 20 years ago, I said yes to Jesus, but all those years are lost. I have nothing to show for all those years that I am a Christian. And I say, what a tragedy. Will I go empty-handed? You know, when, when we leave here, the first stop is at the judgment seat of Christ. And when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, is there going to be any rewards for a life well lived? A life lived in commitment to Christ, in sanctification, in separation, in total commitment? Is there going to be any rewards? Are you going to go empty handed? May God help you. It doesn't have to be like that. You can make a commitment today. Finally, it demands worship. Oh, I'm not going to say much here, but suffice it to say, as you look at your text in Genesis chapter 12, verse number 7, then the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land. And Abraham built an altar to the Lord. Verse number 8 and Abram moved from there to the mountain east of Bethel. And he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. There he built an altar. You see, when you are pursuing God's purpose, worship becomes very important. How important is worship in your life? How important is worship in your life? A.W. Toza said, I can safely say on the authority of all that is revealed in the word of God that any man or woman on this earth who is bored and turned off by worship is not ready for heaven. Don't beat me up if you don't agree. But as I read that, I said, wow. When we get serious about pursuing God's promises, we learn to delight in worship. Close. Let me talk to you about the first step in worship. Because you might be here this morning and if you're honest, you're not even sure if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior. You see, some have gone halfway. They have accepted Jesus as Savior, but some haven't even gone halfway. You haven't even started. Luke 18, two men went up into the temple to worship. The Bible says one man, as he went to worship, here's what he prayed. He prayed and he says, God... You see me? I'm just so glad I'm not like them folks. I don't know. I hope that's not you this morning. If you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus, I hope you're not one of those who feel so good about how righteous you are. Because my Bible says our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. They're just not good enough. But guess what? Another little man, they called him a tax collector. He was a tax collector. The tax collectors were people who were hated. And this little tax collector, the Bible says, while Pharisee was praying this big time prayer, all the tax collector could do, he said, Lord, 
Be merciful to me, a sinner. Do you know that's where it begins? If this morning you're here and you're saying, Pastor, I don't know for sure if Jesus Christ lives in my heart and in my life. If you would come to God this morning and tell him, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Save me. Give me eternal life. He'll do it. I hope you'll do that. Right now. Every head bowed.